Welcome back. Before the break, we were talking about Galatians chapter 6 and the Apostle Paul's admonition to bear one another's burdens. And he talks about bearing one another's burdens and fulfilling the law of Christ. And what we've been discussing, Mark, is that we can't fulfill the law of Christ and be indifferent to the needs of, of our no. fellow brother at the same time. If we're going to be like Christ, we can't have that indifference. We've got to have a compassion for those who are in need. That's right. A person who's converted, Paul said, Christ lives in me. That's right. And we know how Christ lives. Christ does not live with an indifference toward people. So, so if we have that indifference, that should tell us that we need a deeper experience. Amen. Well, you know, we're, Jim, we're going to jump into uh, chapter 6, verse 3. And uh, it says here in Galatians 6, 3, For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for each one shall bear his own load. Now, it's interesting. He's going to make this point again a little bit more fully by talking about reaping and sowing. But in essence, he's saying we need to be careful. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, what do I want to say? A characteristic of the human fallen human condition to, uh, to compare ourselves with one another. That's right. In fact, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 it has, a, has a piece of counsel we're going to look at. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and uh, I want to say it's in verse it's 12. 12. And look at what the Apostle Paul says here. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12 says, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Are not wise. Notice they commend themselves. Why? Well, when you compare yourself, you can always find somebody that you appear to be better than. The fact of the matter is our standard is Christ. And if we always look to Christ, it, it, it produces a total different uh, realization of who we are. That's exactly right. And comparing ourselves to Christ is exactly where I believe he's going in verse 4, because he says, but let each one, I'm back in Galatians 6, mm -hmm. 4, but let each one examine his own work. And you know, in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he also talks about how we should examine ourselves, whether we be in the faith. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly we don't want to spend all of our time looking at ourselves, looking at our own faults. Uh, if we spend all of our time doing that, we'll become discouraged and we'll forget that Christ is there to help us That's in our right. time of need. However, uh, to ignore ourselves and what, and what is going on in terms of our own life and how it compares to the life of Christ is definitely not what the Apostle Paul would have us to do. The idea here is that if we focus on Christ, as we come close to Christ, His goodness pierces our soul and we are able to then evaluate our life in light of the example of Christ. Um, one of my favorite statements is uh, from a book called Steps to Christ, where it says that the closer we come to Christ, the more unworthy we appear in our own eyes. Mm -hmm. So if we'll come close to Christ, then we'll be able to see our own need, and we won't think ourselves to be something. We won't be uh, lifting ourselves up above others. We're going to be able to see ourselves the way we truly are. You know, what's interesting is about that statement. I'm familiar with the one you're bringing up in, in the book Steps to Christ. It goes on to say... Um, that uh, the closer we come to Christ, the more faulty we appear in our own eyes, and that this, this is evidence that the vivifying power or the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit has come upon us. Mm, that's right. Because we couldn't, see our, we couldn't see our true condition if it weren't for the Holy Spirit. And so uh, one minister that I know made this point. When we begin to see our sinfulness, we should take courage that we have enough of the Holy Spirit to be able to see it. that amount of sinfulness. Amen. And that must be an evidence to us that the Spirit's willing and ready to do a work in our hearts that we can't do for ourselves. That's right. When we begin to sense the Holy Spirit pointing out those areas of need, that's nothing less than the voice of Jesus Christ himself speaking to our souls. Absolutely. That's just a powerful thought that when we begin, you know, the reality is when I feel comfortable and feel good about how things are going in my life, sometimes that's the most dangerous position to be in. Yeah. It's when I feel uncomfortable, when I know that I'm not 
exactly where I need to be, that, that, that the Lord Jesus is far more beautiful and far more gracious and far more uh, principled and compassionate and all the things that he is. When I'm looking at him, I'm drawn out after him. And it, there's a, a certain level of uncomfortableness. And yet I know that the voice of Jesus is the one in my heart that's making me sense that. And so it gives me communion with him. That's right. The Christian life is a life of growth. And we would be, uh, a parent would be very alarmed if they had a child that was born and uh, at one year of age, he stopped growing. Right. And here, six months later, he's a year and a half and he hasn't grown from the time he was a year old. Then he's two years old and he hasn't grown at all. You know, the parent would have been to every doctor in town and everything else. But too often as Christians, we're satisfied when we are in the same place we've been for five, 10, 20 years. Right. And so this, what the Lord is wanting us to do is see our weaknesses in examine our own work, not that we would go around discouraged, but it would prompt us to continue to reach out after him so we could continue to grow into Christ likeness. And we would be able to relate to others in the right way because rather than holding ourselves above them, we'd be able to empathize with them because we truly are no better than they. That's exactly right. You know, the other thing is that uh, this is not just good advice. This is essential for us. This is what Paul makes a point of in verse 5. He says, for each one shall bear his own load. In essence, what he's saying is there's an accountability factor here. That's right. And ultimately, you know, as we bear one another's burdens, we seek to help others. And, uh, you know, you can't, we can't make uh, you can't give a Christian experience to somebody else as much as you can seek to bear their burdens. But we have to answer for our own choices. We have to answer for our own decisions and our own experience or lack thereof. And so he says each one is, in essence, going to bear his own load. And as he says that, he leads in to a very challenging few verses mm -hmm. where he tries to describe for them the, the difficulty they're going to have if they accept this gospel of circumcision or the works of the law that's being presented to them by these Judaizing uh, Christians. Yes. If you look in verse 6, let's pick up there and just read a few more verses. It says, let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. The idea here is that the apostle Paul, he himself is helping to bear the burdens of these Galatians. He is seeking to reach those who have fallen themselves, which is this church who is now, uh, many of these Gentile believers have begun to go the way of these Judaizing teachers. And, and he's now saying, I'm trying to bear your burdens. I want you to share in this same and have a burden for others. We need to be bearing each other's burdens. Then he says in verse 7, do not be deceived. And that's important. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. The idea here is that the Apostle Paul is saying, you know, this gospel of circumcision or the works of the law, it leaves you in the flesh. Because when you don't believe in justification by faith in Christ, when you don't see the need for that union with Christ, you don't receive the Spirit, and all that's left is the flesh. And if you sow to your flesh, you will reap corruption. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a very clear warning that he's giving. You know, I want to add to that something that is very important here is, he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. corruption. This is not an arbitrary decree from a God who's angry because you chose something different than what he asked you to do. God's trying to communicate to us that the flesh brings corruption. Sin has its own penalty built into it. God is not trying to keep us from the fun things in life. God's trying to shield us from the things that would destroy us. That's right. You're going to reap what you sow. Mm -hmm. And that's why he says, don't be deceived. Yeah. I mean, these people are trying to deceive him. And, you know, there's a couple of other passages within Scripture that use those words, do not be deceived. One of them is when John writes in 1 John 3, 8, not to be deceived. He who practices righteousness, he says, is righteous. Mm. Someone can't claim righteousness by circumcision and yet be practicing the works of the flesh. That's right. He says, if they do, they're not righteous. He who practices righteousness is righteous. Don't be deceived by that. In another place, James says, don't be just hearers of the law, but doers, or hearers, hearers of, the, of the, word, the word, but doers. Um, and then he says that if you are just hearers of the law, you're going to be deceiving yourselves. Yeah. So the idea is don't be deceived by the idea that you can just hear the law, claim righteousness through circumcision or anything else, and yet be living a life that's not a righteous life. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. What right. You're going to reap what you sow. It's very clear that he says that. But right after this, he says, if you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap everlasting life. Mm -hmm. 
And then he encourages them in verse 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Here he's helping these Galatians to understand that what they've done is that they've gotten weary in doing good. Uh, Back in chapter 5, verse 7, he said, you ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Well, that's exactly what he's saying here. Let's not grow weary in doing good. You are on the right track. Don't grow weary and go the easy route with these uh, uh, false deceptions. And the idea is that if you don't, if you stay with the Lord Jesus, you will reap everlasting life. And there's a a verse I'd like to look on this point in Hebrews chapter 10 that really powerfully illustrates this. It's in verse 23. He says in Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. That's the same thing he's saying in Galatians. We will reap if we don't lose heart. He who promised is faithful. If we keep with the Lord Jesus, and if we don't give up because of the flesh's temptations, we can be sure that we're going to reap everlasting life. You know, Jim, it's interesting. The next verse there in Hebrews says, and let us consider one another Mm. in order to stir up love and good works. It's again, the idea of bearing one another's burdens. That's right. And that takes us to the verse 10 there in Galatians, that very next verse in chapter six, verse 10, he says, therefore, as we have... Uh, opportunity, let us do good to all, and notice, especially to those who are of the household of faith. faith. I'll tell you, Jim, one thing that bears heavy on my heart is how Christians can be the meanest to Christians. Yeah. You know, we, we, it's, we like to pick on each other. I mean, I hear all the time Christians getting on all the bad Christians versus Giving them um, the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, and seeking to guard one another's reputation. Right. Uh, you know, it's it's we can you know you can see a person on the street. Oh, we're going to witness to him. We're going to share it with him. We're going to talk to him about the love of Jesus. We see somebody in church. We hold a we hold a grudge with him for thirty years. That's right. You know, where does this come from? Certainly not from the spirit. The it comes flesh. from the flesh. And so the apostle urges us here to do good to all, especially those of the household of faith. Even Jesus said. That in our worship, if you come to the altar and there remember you have something, somebody has something against you, go and make that right. right. Have a burden for reconciliation with one another. Jesus said, people will know you're my disciples by the love you have for one another. So let us seek to bear one another's burdens, to restore others in the spirit of gentleness, to love others as Christ loved us. Amen. 